With the popularity of microservices, tooling like Kafka, and event sourcing, the term event is pretty overloaded. It's actually caused a lot of confusion on what event-driven architecture actually is. There's different concepts like event carried state transfer, events as notification, and event sourcing that if you confuse them and conflate them together, you'll end up with a lot of unneeded complexity. I'm gonna unravel what these concepts are so you have a better understanding of what event-driven architecture actually is. Hey everybody, it's Derek Kilmartin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design, so if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So first, let me talk about the context and some of the concepts that I'm gonna be explaining and where they're really applicable and where I see them in uh, most often used. So I'm really talking about large systems and they're being decomposed, hence why you might be using them if you're defining services or microservices. This is where you're often using some of the ideas behind a venture of an architecture. So generally, these are line of business and enterprise type systems that I'm referring to. So Gregor Hope posted this um, a few weeks ago, or actually more a month ago now from this video. And he posted, by the time a new uh, IT term gains mainstream adoptions, it's guaranteed to already have lost its meaning. And I think this is true in our industry in a lot of ways, as well as I always view this from Martin Fowler, the semantic diffusion, which when a word is coined by a person or group, it has a pretty good definition, and then it gets spread through the wider community, it weakens that definition. Now the thing with event-driven architecture, it's not exactly that way. It's just taken on kind of different forms and different ways of applying it kind of over time. So I'm gonna talk about kind of the various ways that really event-driven architecture is applied. So there's a few really good blog posts that kind of illustrate this. Um, I covered this blog post. This was from um, a Wix.com developer, Nathan Silnitsky. And they have this five pitfalls to avoid kind of in their journey to a venture of an architecture. And a lot of the posts here, like I love these posts because they do illustrate, they really are kind of common things that people run into, but it also has a part of it where it is kind of confusing different concepts that I'm about to illustrate. There's also another post called Don't Let the Internet Dupe You, Event Sourcing is Hard. And I'm gonna have a link to these two articles in the description, but this post as well, really kind of exemplifies if you confuse different concepts together, you're gonna end up in a bad place. All right, so event-driven architecture. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Sorry, I had to post that. Kevin on my private Discord server also recommended it when I was talking about doing this video, so I had to. So what are we talking about with event-driven architecture? The four concepts I really wanna talk about and how they're used is using events as a way to persist state for data distribution and as a way for notifications. If we break these down, it really comes into talking about event sourcing, event carried state transfer, domain events, integration events, and workflow events. So all these are all kind of the concepts I'm gonna talk about. And if you confuse these things, like I said, this is when you kind of get into a pile of hurt. I think one thing I gotta leave out a little bit and I'll save for a separate video um, is event streaming. Although I will talk about event streams and I will talk about tooling that's built around event streaming. And speaking of tooling, some of the confusion here, not necessarily because of tooling, but because some tools can do multiple things. You have different things here like end service bus, which is a messaging library in .NET. We have Event Store, who sponsors a bunch of my videos, thanks to them, which is a database specifically for event sourcing. And then there's different tools like Debezium, which is a change data capture tool that can um, publish events to Kafka top topics. So I have Kafka here, and then which is a distributed uh, log. Then I have something like RabbitMQ, which is more your typical queue-based broker. And then I have your cloud um, infrastructure there, like Azure Service Bus for messaging, Event Grid, Event Hubs. Um, and then the SNS, SQS, et cetera, on the AWS side. And there's many, many more different tools. Not that any of these tools are causing the issue of confusion. It's just that a lot of them can do multiple things. So it feels like you should just do all of the different ideas and concepts with one individual tool. So first, let's talk about event sourcing. 
So fundamentally, event sourcing is a way to persist state. Instead of persisting state like this, let's say we have a relational database, or you could think of a document store and a document. Let's say we have a particular product in a warehouse, and it's SKU, that product identifier is YYZ987. We have a quantity on hand of 27. We last received this on a particular date, and we last shipped that product out on a particular date. Now with event sourcing, the idea is instead of recording current state like that, rather we record the events, the facts, that we can use to then derive what current state is. So we record everything in a stream of events that is kind of getting us to that place. So what's what really happened? How did we really get there? Well, we probably actually received product from a shipment from our vendor, so we received 30 on a given date. Then we maybe received another shipment, um, let's say on the exact same date of a quantity of five. So now really, if we're kind of keeping track of our quantity on hand, we're at 35. Then let's say we had some orders that we had to ship out. So we shipped out an order. It had a quantity of six, so I'm at uh, 29. And then let's say we did a stock count, which is typical in a warehouse, accounting all the particular products, and we realized, oh, two of them were broken, so we need to adjust our quantity on hand. So we're now should be at 27. So our representation of current state could be, we know when we shipped it, we know when we last received it, we know our quantity on hand. This is actually how we got here this series of events, things that have happened, these business concepts that have happened in the past that we care about, that's how we can get to current state. And that's how we record what our state is. So when you're thinking about a stream of events, it is usually for an aggregate or something unique, let's say our product. So if we're thinking about our relational model here, we have different rows. Let's say we have another product, DER576, and it has a quantity hand, the same type of information. With event sourcing, we would have another stream of events for that particular product to record all the, those different state transitions, so th those occurrences of things that happen um, through its kind of life cycle. So we have product re received for that other product, we had some product shipped for it, and uh, shipped again. So we have these two different streams for these two different products in our warehouse. So what am I ultimately describing? Well, I'm describing that event sourcing is about state. It's how we persist state. So Greg Young, who you might be most familiar with for event sourcing and has probably been the spearheading person to lead all this charge, is finally apparently writing a book. I follow him on Twitter. He posted this a few months ago, but I know he's been heavily into it. And I took a screen capture because this, what he said, was one of the most important pieces so far that he had to write of the book when he started it. And this is the section that I've highlighted, I think is the most important, is event sourcing is that we will store facts, events, which have occurred. Any state that we have is derived off this set of facts, and any state that we have is transient. I replied to Greg, I said, I wish you would have coined it fact sourcing, because then we wouldn't have this confusion with event sourcing and how events, but I still think it's very applicable. But again, the key here, the key is event sourcing is about state. Why this is so important is because people confuse this with the idea of using events that are state as a way to understand what's happening in another system, which I'm going to talk about as a form of communication. But the thing is, is just like any other service that you have that has its own database, we don't do this anymore. We don't have service A reach out to service B's database. We don't do this. We realize that that uh, databases for service B that's its own internal implementation detail of how it persists state. We don't go reach to it. Rather, we have to reach out to service B through some type of API, some type of contract that we have. We can't just go middling and, and trying to reach out to its database specifically. So if that's the case, the same holds true. If, you have, if you're doing event sourcing in service A and you have an event store, you can't have some other service just randomly go and reach out to your database, your internal implementation detail. Just because you're event sourcing doesn't change the fact that somebody else can go reach in to your service boundary and interact with your database directly. So event sourcing is about state. It's about persisting state of likely your aggregates and it's an internal implementation detail. Why this causes so much confusion and technical chaos and complexity is because people want to treat it as well as the other form of using event-driven architecture, which is using events as a form of communication. Don't conflate these two ideas here. So when we're using events and event-driven architecture as a way to communicate between different service boundaries, what does that really look like? 
Well, there's kind of two forms of this that usually play out. There's more behavioral, which are using uh, events as a means of notification to notify another service boundary that something important has occurred. And secondly, which I think is probably becoming the most popular, and I got a little asterisk here because I want to talk about this more, is this a form of distributing data. And typically this is kind of more in a CRUD form. So create, read, update, delete, usually done by the idea of an entity or a little bit more fine grain by CRUD by property. And I'll explain what these are. So why would we want to distribute data around to different services? Why does this happen? So typically why this happens is because let's say we have a client call service A and we have certain capabilities that we provide here, but for some reason we need data from service B or for some reason we need to make a call to service B. If we're doing that in a synchronous way via HP, gRPC, et cetera, if we have any issue with service B, the problem is that our request from service A originating from our client is going to fail. And this is when people start realizing, okay, well, I don't want to have the service to service synchronous communication all over the place. Rather, what I would do is move to something asynchronous so that I have the data that I need when I need it, when a call is made. That way, when a client calls our particular service, we just reach out to our database and we have all the data we need. We don't need to think about making that call to service B. So how do we get all the data that we need? That's when the idea of kind of propagating data comes up. So the first thing that usually happens is people will create an event kind of more, like I was saying that in more in a CRUD sense, and they'll say that a product has changed. Let's say we're talking about a product in a warehouse. We're going to have our product changed event. That's going to get published to some topic uh, for a particular SKU, that a product identifier, we're identifying what changed. So what will happen here is that let's say service B is the one that's publishing that event. And service A, it's the one that's going to subscribe to that product changed event. And what it's going to need to do then is it's going to then make a call back, a synchronous call back to service B to say, hey, this product change, give me the, all the information I need about that product so that I can then update my local database, which is kind of like a local cache about that product information. So that's kind of the first step of really what people start doing here. The second one really relates to, well, what happens if we make that synchronous call to get that product information, the product change, but uh-oh, there was a failure. I tried to make that call back and I can't. So I have this event that I need to process. I know now my data that I have in my local database is stale, but I'm trying to make this call and it's unavailable. There's a bug, there's some issue. I can't get that data. So now the problem is we have stale data. And what exactly are you doing with that data in your local database? So what's the next progression of this? Is starting to include the state in the event. So then what often happens is we have more, maybe a more granular um, event, something like the product price changed event. And I wanna focus on the names here because I'm mentioning they're very CRUD kind of centric. They're product price change or, or product changed, et cetera. So now what we're doing is we're saying, that's the event, it's a little bit more granular. It just changed. Why it changed? I don't know. But here's the SKU for that, that identifier of the product. And here's what the current state is now when that price actually changed. So let's say that it's $80. You may go a little bit more of a fatter event, which then becomes, okay, well, I don't want to keep track of the deltas because maybe based on our UI, this is really difficult to do. So we're just going to publish a product changed event, include all the details about that entity because we're kind of entity centric here of the SKU, maybe the name, the price, all that details. I don't care what change. We're just going to publish this event and let the consumers just deal with all the properties and whatever they want to update. So our events kind of get started as maybe potentially kind of just these Delta changes, uh, which may or may not be hard to figure out. A lot of this is derived by your UI. And then it can get a little bit fatter where we have all this state uh, within our events. So what happens is when we publish that product changed event with all that data, or even just the product price changed event, now we don't need to do that callback. We don't need to call us back service B. We can just use that data directly within the event and then update our local database. So there's various change data capture tools, one of them being an example here of Dbezium, which can sit on top of MySQL or Postgres. It understands, for example, in MySQL, the bin log, 
and it can then publish the changes, the delta changes of your update statements, deletes, inserts, etc. And it can make turn those into events to publish onto a Kafka topic, which then you can have different um, sync connectors to then output that somewhere else. Like for example, Elastic, some data warehouse, wherever you wanna get uh, and basically be pushing that data to. But why do you wanna do this exactly? Typically this is because we're thinking about entities, entity services, and not necessarily at the forefront thinking about behavior and then the data that we need for business logic. So instead of having a monolith, if we have services or microservices, whatever, that have their own databases, the data that they own, we end up starting to duplicate all this data all over the place when we're really kind of still in this distributed monolith. Even though we're not making request response from service to service, we're still doing it asynchronously because still we're still treating it like we need data from another service. Now I have videos on doing UI, view model, query composition, where you do need data from multiple services. The often things though is why do you need that data? If you need it to perform some type of business logic, realize that you have stale data because it's coming from another service. Even if it was a request response, if it's stale data, it's local data that you have, it's stale data. Can you perform that business logic on stale data? Now, like in that slide with the CDC and Debezium, it mentioned data warehousing. And to me, that's actually a really good use case of where you wanna have all this disparate data kind of conform into one place that you could actually do some reporting on, some BI, et cetera. The difference with this, as opposed to what I'm getting next, is you can still have the same type of idea of having these services own their data, but rather what you're doing, instead of propagating and kind of distributing data from service to service via events, really what you're starting to use events for are notifications and their business concepts. I alluded to this before in the name. It's not that the product changed. Why did the product change? Oh, well, it's the product price changed. Well, why? What was there a sale? Did we increase the price? Did we decrease the price? It's actually the idea behind this is driven by the domain. It's the business. It's things that they actually care about. And you're going to be using these for notifications, for integrations with other service boundaries and workflows. So there's different ways of thinking about these. It's not to get into the nitty gritty. I have videos on this, but there's the idea of generally about domain events, which generally can be considered kind of inside events. It's within your, your service boundary of that particular subdomain. You may have integration events that you want to expose because these are a little bit different in the, the sense that you could think of them like your API through your contracts. These are going to version differently than something internal to you like domain events. But regardless, both of them you're really using as a means of notification. So let's talk about why you would use them as notification. Now I'm going to go through a transition here to really explain this because what I'm going to get down to is really the event contains really nothing more than an identifier. So first, kind of the way you could think of this is let's say we're going through an e-commerce uh, checkout process. So we have our basket, our client goes to the ordering API and submits all the data related to, let's say our credit card information, shipping information, et cetera. And then what we do is that we're gonna publish an event called an order placed event with the details of the address, the payment information, all the items, everything related to that order. You kind of think of this as the event carried state transfer. We have a lot of data in that event. And then from there, it gets published to our broker, our request to our client's done. Okay, thanks for your order, your order's been placed. Asynchronously, obviously through publish subscribe, we have the payment service that's gonna be subscribing to that event, to that particular topic, wherever that resides. And then because it has all that information in the event, it can then persist that to its database, the payment details. And let's say that at some point then it has to reach out to the API gateway that it's using to charge the customer's credit card. All that information was contained in the event. Yes, something like credit card, we could be encrypting those properties or the message itself. But generally the idea what I'm trying to get across here is we still have these really fat events that contain all the information. And the reason this is, is because we're just not thinking about kind of the idea of that uh, a service should have the data that it needs. It's really about the workflow. So rather the alternative here is when our client makes that initial checkout uh, request to our ordering service, let me just really kick off the workflow. So at this point we could be saying to our ordering service, okay, here's the items, here's our shipping address, for example, 
And then from there, the next part of the process after it saves that data is the client then might send that payment information to the payment service. Here's that order ID or some deterministic ID that we've generated by a client or ordering that started it gives it to us. Here's the payment information. Here's my number, here's the expiry. And at this point, what the payment can do, it can just persist that information. At this point, it's really kind of temporary storage because we haven't done anything with it. We haven't placed our order. We haven't had to charge the customer's credit card. It's not until the client and our UI tells our ordering, place now. Yes, I reviewed my order. I actually want to place this order where we can then make our state change to actually place that order. And then we can publish that order placed event simply with our order ID. This is drastically different. We don't need to have all that data within our event because the, the boundaries that require certain data already have the data that we need. So we're really just using this event as a means of notification to our payment service so that I can consume that event when it's published and it can say, oh yeah, I have that, uh, that payment information for order ID one, two, three. Then I can use that information that I already have locally to then go and hit my payment gateway to charge the customer's credit card. So what I'm describing here is using events as notifications and a way to do this is event choreography. To go on that example a little bit farther is that you're just having services consume events and publish events. And really they're unaware that they're a part of kind of a business process and workflow. So let's take that one a little bit further where when we had our order that was placed, we could then be publishing that order placed event to our message broker, to a topic. And from there, we could have our payment service as the example. It's the one subscribing to that order placed event. And from there, just as earlier, it has the details. So it go hit the payment gateway. If that was successful, maybe it publishes a payment completed event. And that's going back to our broker, maybe to a different topic that the warehouse is the one that cares about that specific uh, payment completed event. It's the one that's consuming it. From there, it could then create a shipping label with whatever shipping services we're using. But the idea here is that there was no defined central orchestrated place of this workflow. We just have different services, consuming events and publishing events. They don't really know that they're a part of a workflow, but this is event choreography. And really you're using events as a means of notification. Now, if you're new to event driven architecture and you're thinking, well, how can I start? I don't really have all these services. Maybe I'm even in within a monolith. And this is actually a great place to start is thinking of it the same way, but instead of workflows between different services, think of just the ideas of things that you can do asynchronously when something occurs via a notification and an event. So the classic example of this, let's say we have our service for sales and it publishes that order placed event. Well, within that logical boundary of sales, maybe there's things that we need to do, like obviously send the email confirmation. Maybe we need to have some text message SMS go out to our customers. Maybe we have a webhook system where we wanna call some other third party HTTP API when an order is placed. All these can live within that same logical boundary, that service, and we could just have consumers for it. Meaning we're producing the message, that event, and we're also consuming it. So we could have all these different consumers, the one for email, let's say that's talking to AWS SES to send the email. We have this homegrown webhook system where we make calls to HTTP APIs, third parties. And then maybe we, again, we're talking to Twilio for sending out an SMS. So the idea here is that you can also be the consumer and the producer. It doesn't have to be that you have services. You can do this within a monolith. And this is an actually a really kind of great way to start is trying to look for those places where something occurs like an order placed, an event, and then you wanna do something else that isn't critical um, in terms of happening within the same trans transaction, especially like sending an email. So back to tooling, why does this matter? Because depending on what you're trying to do, are you trying to use kind of data duplication everywhere? And I hope for the right reasons. Are you trying to do event sourcing? Are you trying to do more pub stub messaging, potentially also with the idea of commands and doing orchestration, then you're gonna wanna use the appropriate tool for the job. Yes, some of these kind of cover a bunch of the ideas, but don't be confused that just because it's suitable for one, that it's suitable for everything. So as always, just understand the tools that you're using and understanding the concepts and if those tools support it. So kind of to go over this, event sourcing, what is it? It's about state. It's about persisting state and you're using events as a way to do that. Think of them as facts. They're internal, they're an implementation detail. They're not used for notifications. 
if you're using event carried state transfer, you're kind of using that as a means to distribute data. Are you doing that for kind of query reporting purposes? Realize that if you're distributing this data, you have stale data. Yes, data is stale the second that you select it from a service or even from your own service. But there's a lot of implications when you're trying to use that data to perform some type of business logic. At that point, I'd be asking, really take a look at your boundaries. Where the data resides, should it really reside there? The idea of having events as a form of kind of communication, as notification for workflows, for business processes. There's different ways of kind of dealing with these workflows in orchestration, which is a combination of commands and kind of queue based work and pub sub, which I talked about doing strictly with choreography, which again is kind of having these long running processes that really don't have a central spot, but you just have events being consumed and events being produced. So hopefully this provided some insight. So when somebody says to you that they're using a venture and architecture, you can ask a little bit more deeply, specifically how are they using event sourcing? Are they using event carry state transfer? Or are they using events for notifications? At the very end of this video, I'm gonna have two videos that I think are the most appropriate to this topic that will probably cover it on a different angle. So check out those. If you enjoy this type of topic, these types of ideas, and you wanna to talk to other developers about software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And as always, please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.